As the 1913-14 season came to a close, the Queen's Park team embarked on the club's fifth continental tour to Denmark and Sweden. The tour party, consisting of 14 players, six club officials and a team trainer, exuded good humour and bonhomie. As one Evening Times reporter noted, the voyage was enjoyed most thoroughly by as happy and brotherly a crowd of boys as ever wore the world-famous colours of the old club. Among them was Eddie Garvey, a versatile player on the field and the life and soul of the party off it, on account of his sense of humour and his ability to entertain the tourists on a wide range of musical instruments. But he was to take on a more serious role only a few months later, as Britain went to war. By December, it was reported that 71 members and players from Queen's Park had enlisted for service. The same newspaper commended the player's sense of duty, stating, it is singularly appropriate that the oldest amateur football club now playing what is termed first-class football and the premier club in Scotland should show a record unequaled by any other club. In total, uh, at least 226 uh, members and players, whether former, present or future, from Queen's Park eventually enlisted for service during the war. And they enlisted in a a variety, the full variety of, of regiments and battalions, but without question the, the regiment which is most associated with the, the enlistments from Queen's Park is the Highland Light Infantry. At least 50 Queen's Park members and players served at one time or another with the Highland Light Infantry, and within that 50, at least 30 of them served at one time or another with the 9th Glasgow Highland Battalion. On July 14th, 1916, the Glasgow Highlanders were forced to dig in overnight near Highwood on the Somme, after a failed advance towards German positions they believed had already been cleared. On the following morning, on July the 15th, the Glasgow Highlanders were ordered to advance again to uh, the position that they were supposed to have reached the previous evening, again being told that Highwood by this time had been taken from the Germans by other units of the British Army. But again, we quickly discovered as they moved through the eastern fringes of Highwood that this was not the case. And this time, the, the devastating effect of the machine guns were all too clear. 192 Glasgow Highlanders were killed within a couple of hours on the morning of July the 15th. And that number included uh, John Barber, who had played for Queen's Park before the war, before leaving to go and join Dundee and then Preston North End. After Barber's death, the Lancashire Daily Post reported on the battle. Though he more recently played for Dundee and Preston North End, his name will be more closely linked with the Queen's Park Club. Whatever the motive took him from Hamden, there can be no doubt he sat lay there always. A thorough young sportsman, he played the games as a sportsman should and never made an enemy on the football field. John Barber met his death charging the enemy. George Dixon, the ex-Rangers reserve forward, was at his side in the charge when he fell, and he says the ex-Queen's Park boy died like a true and gallant soldier. Among the Queen's players who survived the traumatic events of 1916 was Walter Coulter, who worked at Fairfield Shipyards on the Clyde. On February the 17th of the following year, the, the Glasgow Highlanders had moved to the Arras sector and uh, Walter Coulter uh, was awarded the Military Cross for his gallantry in leading a 25-man raiding team on a night raid on the, the German trench lines and the, the citation at the time referred to the fact that he led his men with great dash and the success of the raid was largely due to his personal coolness and initiative. In actual fact, Walter Coulter uh, was the officer in charge of writing the official report of the, the, the actions and he did not make any reference at all to his contribution. And it was only when a, his senior commanding officer then added notes on a later occasion that his name was, was brought into the equation. Within three months of being awarded the Military Cross, Walter Coulter was shot and killed. His body was never recovered 
and he is commemorated on the Arras Memorial in France. The Battle of Arras held significance for another Queen's Park player, Ralph Risk. He was overtaken, I think, by Alan Morton, who played in the same position, which made it very difficult for my father to get very many games. But he was, I understand, very well known for one thing, which was his speed off the mark. Um, there was a, an article in the one of the evening papers in Glasgow when a commentator was summarising his career of football and he talked about the, the greats of football, about Alan Morton and the others. And one of the things he wrote was, but of all the players I've ever known, the fastest person over 10 yards was a complete unknown from Queen's Park called Ralph Risk. Um, but I sometimes think that that comment may have been helpful to my father while he was in the trenches. Just six days before Coulter's death and only eight miles away, Ralph Risk received the first of two military crosses. It's quite a remarkable story. He wins the military cross not once but twice um, and he also obviously sees promotion as well. He goes from second lieutenant to lieutenant and then on to captain. I think the first military cross comes in the Arras Offensive of 1917. Um, and he leads a, a, a platoon uh, during that offensive out to like an advanced forward position and he holds that position under severe enemy fire um, and he holds it until he's ordered to come back by his own superiors and it's recognised the individual bravery but also the, the example that he leads to his men and it's recognised by obviously the award of the military cross. He never spoke about these things to me but I remember on one occasion he, he talked about the fact that he was only frightened one particular time and that was having to go down into some cellars below a chemical works, below a factory, uh, where the Germans were, were hiding and he, was, he claimed to have been petrified at that time. Um, but he, at that stage I think he was wounded on that occasion, uh, a little bit of shrapnel hit his leg and uh, he was out of action for a spell, but that one figures in my memory most because I used to use his old army kilt, which I'd, he'd kept, and I used to wear it for years. And there was a hole opposite the, the leg, which he claimed was a bullet hole, but I think it was probably that bit of shrapnel or a later moth. Riss never returned to first-team football. He went on, however, to play a significant role in the club as an able administrator, who made cup finals and internationals a regular feature at the expanding Hampden Park, including the Scotland-England fixture of 1937, attended by 149,000 eager spectators, which remains to this day a European record for an international fixture. He certainly gave great service to Queen's on the committee and was twice president of the club in, in the 1930s. So a uh, I, I, man who great, gave great service, I suppose, to the country and also to Queen's Park. Of the 196 Queen's Park members who survived the Great War, three more would go on to serve as club presidents, four received bravery awards, and five were capped for Scotland. Among the 33 who did not return from the front was Eddie Garvey. Queen's Park's musician-in-chief and one of the club's finest pre-war players, whose promising career was cut short by enlistment and whose life, like that of many of his teammates, was cut short by the horror of war. Great regret will be felt all over Scotland by the news of the death of Lance Corporal E.S. Garvey, who died in Germany from wounds received in France. Best all-round player Queen's Park has known for many years, scrupulously fair and wonderfully clever in all he attempted, source of delight to the Hamden following and the envy of several clubs. Would almost certainly have been capped this season. Southern Press, November the 5th, 1915.